How's everybody doing this morning? Hello, hello, hello. Good to see everybody. Go ahead and turn down my sound so I don't get an echo in the classroom. Looks like we've got a couple of people here today. Mel G's in the house and Xiao Yun. Uh, hopefully somebody else will join us, but if not, it'll just be an intimate little party with us three today. Uh, Mel G talking about some coronavirus uh, in her hospital. Um, so what kinds of protective activities do you do to uh, keep yourself safe, Mel? I'd be interested in hearing about that. That must be pretty stressful having to go to work every day knowing you're around people who are contagious, um, who have an illness that you don't want to get, nor do you want to pass on to people. I can't even imagine what that must be like. <clears throat> Xiaoyun, are you doing okay? You just texted me a hello and a good afternoon. It's good afternoon to you as well, Xiaoyun. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your high school experiences in China yesterday in class. I thought that was very interesting to hear about uh, your life. Um, and I, I liked it. it was really neat how you uh, were asked to write out your plans as a middle schooler and then you never revisited those again. Uh, it was kind of interesting, but thank you very much for sharing that with us. Okay. So, uh, today we're going to talk about the difference between good friends and bad friends. We're going to talk about all the social aspects related to uh, socio-emotional development in a larger group aspect uh, sort of focus today. So, we're going to talk about friends, the difference between good friends and bad friends. Then we're going to talk about the different types of groupings that you'll find in adolescence. And we're going to talk a little bit about peer pressure and who's most, uh, who's most susceptible to peer pressure pressure and then we're going to talk about the development of romantic relationship behaviors in adolescence we're going to talk a little bit about media usage and we're going to talk about juvenile delinquency so those are sort of the four things that i'm going to cover today and i've got this bicultural identity that's actually a typo i shouldn't have that in there we talked about that on tuesday but here we go all right and if you remember looking at the uh, chart right beside me uh, we are in the one, two, three, four, fifth stage, uh, adolescence, 10 to 12 years to 18 to 21 years old. And we're talking about socio-developmental processes. Looks like we got another person joining. I don't know who it is. Is it you, Andre, or is it Mr. Fleming? Whoever it is, I'm glad to see you. Thanks for coming today. We'll talk a little bit about friendship and adolescence. So uh, in adolescence, you know what, you're going to stop, uh, you're going to uh, sort of lose interest in the big groups and it's going to move more down to smaller numbers of friendships that are more intense and intimate. You're going to get yourself a little gang, if you will, um, a cohort of two or three people whom you always hang out with and who you share all of your secrets with. It's not going to be any much the big group, the group playing activities anymore. It's going to be you and a small group of uh of, of cohorts. Now, uh, your friends during this age are going to become increasingly important in meeting your social needs because you're going to stop talking to your parents as much. Um, you are going to really focus all of your disclosures and uh, most private thoughts, feelings, desires. They're probably going to be um, uh, more, you're going to be more likely to describe those with your friends than you are with your parents at this time. Friends are going to become really important. But you know what? Like your mom said, uh, you are a product of the company you keep. So if you lie down with dogs, you will wake up with fleas. So uh, the types of friends you have are important. So uh, I don't know if any of you have had the experience of watching your kids bring different groups of friends home. If your, friend, if your kids bring home good friends uh, who, are, who are socially skilled, who are oriented uh, towards academic activity, and who are nice to your siblings, uh, having a good set of friends is going to have developmental advantages for your adolescence. They're going to do well in school. They're not going to get in as much trouble and they're going to have less emotional problems. So having good friends is going to be good for your kids, but only if they are kids who aren't, who are socially skilled and academically oriented and supportive, right? 
However, uh, some kids get in with the wrong group, as they say. Um, if your friends get in with a group of people who are coercive in their behavior and is not as much supportive but as coercive, if your child gets involved with groups uh, and cliques of friends that have lots of drama and conflict, that's not going to be good either. And uh, if your friends if your kids develop uh, friendships with people who don't know how to be good friends and who don't know how to be uh, supportive, uh, things aren't going to turn out as well for your children. And in fact, the research suggests that having older friends is associated to a certain degree with delinquency and early sexual behavior. How many of you had older friends in high school? Mel G, I think you might have even talked about having old, uh, older friends in high school and you know when you're hanging out with those older kids you're always going to get engaged in some older more risky activities never a good thing i don't think now if you look at the graph right be un right below me what you're going to see is that the amount of self-disclosure uh, that kids do with their parents greatly decreases after the age of fifth grade or so, and they're going to start telling all their thoughts and secrets to their friends. So this is sort of the pattern of self-disclosure that you're going to see throughout adolescence. And like I said, the, the friends are going to become a more important part of your kid's uh, uh, social sphere than are the parents. Now, uh, what clique did you hang out in uh, in school? So a clique is a small group of five or six individuals that are based on similar interests that engage in similar activities. I remember I hung out with a small clique of guys. Um, unfortunately, we like to go out and do bad things, but I had a very small clique of five or six guys, and we were always up to some sort of shenanigans in high school. I remember it was Dave, my other friend, Chris, um, uh, it was uh, Greg, and there were like three or four of us, and we always hang out. Actually, there was two Daves, Dave and Dave, uh, Chris and Greg, and then me, and that was sort of my clique. And we all really liked rock and roll. We loved Van Halen. This was the 80s, and Van Halen was our jam. Van Halen and Rush. And so we all listen to that music and we all like to party a little bit and hang out on Friday and Saturday nights and smoke cigarettes, Mel, and smoke cigarettes is what we did. Okay, now, so that was sort of the click. Now, what sort of crowd did you run with? So a crowd is sort of larger than a click and it's less personal, but it is still sort of ba based on interests. Were you a jock? Were you a stoner? Were you the nerd? Were you the goody two shoes kind of kid? Which larger crowd did you hang out with? Or if you were like me, did you sort of touch each and every one of these crowds? So I played baseball with the uh, jocks. I went to school with the good kids and the nerds in, in the classroom. And then after school, when I was goofing off, I would hang out with the stoners, right? How many of you surf from group to group to group uh, as, as high school kids? right so we have these clicks and you sort of have crowds and that's how uh, kids are going to be organized in the high school and these clicks can be these small intimate groups that we find inside the crowds now at this age actually they talk about peer pressure in this age but really as a social psychologist peer pressure or what we call social influence is a product of every social situation even though your parents may look at you like you're a fool for going along with the crowd, what they don't realize is that they go along with the crowd at work too. We are all influenced by these social situations. But we specifically talk about peer pressure, uh, especially related to high school kids, because we're talking about that social pressure exhibited by peer group on a person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. If your friend smokes cigarettes, what's the likelihood that you're gonna smoke cigarettes? If your friends drink alcohol, what's the likelihood that you're gonna drink alcohol? If all of your friends are having sex, how are you going to avoid having sex and still talk up and still be around your friends? So in a sense, all of these uh, kids in your clique, they're really important and they're gonna be the ones that can exert this uh, peer influence over you. Now, how many of you, some of you were able to resist it. And you know what, just because my friends were drinking alcohol, I knew it wasn't important for me. That's great, resisting peer pressure. I knew all of my friends were having sex in ninth or 10th grade, 
but I resisted because I knew it wasn't good. That's a that's great. And those are people who are able to resist peer pressure, but a lot of us aren't. But who's really most likely to, uh, to, to respond to peer pressure? And your book suggests that there are some patterns that we will see. Uh, your younger adolescents are going to be more, uh, more influenced by peer standards uh, um, they, than when they were as 11, 10, and uh, nine-year-olds. So it's really going to peak in this early adolescent period of 12, 13, and 14. You're going to want to get your hair cut like all of your friends. You're going to wear the same clothes as all of your friends. So we're really going to have quite a bit of pressure, which just appears, not appears, but sort of peaks in early adolescence. Now you're going to find that boys are more peer-influenced uh, about sexual behavior than our girls. Uh, all of us guys talk about it and we make bold claims about what we have and have not done and who we have and have not done it with. And there's a lot of pressure um, on our guys uh, to engage in uh, sexual pressure. Now, what your book's going to suggest is that in general, Adolescents with low self-esteem and high social anxiety, which might come from poor attachment styles, are most likely to conform to peers during uh, conform to peers and during transitions. I don't know if any of you moved when you were uh, an adolescent. I moved twice in adolescence, once in seventh grade and once in eleventh grade, and it is totally weird going into a new school as an adolescent. And you are clearly under some pressure to find a group, a clique or a crowd, if you will, and conform to the standards of that group. And if you have low self-esteem or you're anxious about groups in general, it's going to magnify the effect of peer pressure. How many of you were able to uh, to avoid peer pressure. Do any of you have any interesting stories of peer pressure in high school? Hi, D. It's good to see you today. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're talking a little bit about the groups that we were in. Uh, what was your click like, D? Uh, did you have four or five people that you hung out with that you were really, really tight? Um, and what larger crowd did you find yourself a part of? Were you a jock, a stoner, a nerd kid? Or did you have a different kind of crowd in your class? We'd all be interested in hearing. Okay. Now, uh, dating and romance. Uh, one of the other hallmark activities of high school is falling in love, going to the prom, passing notes, uh, finding out who loves who, getting your first kiss. Oh my goodness, adolescence is the time when romantic relationships blossom. And for the first time, we really start thinking about love. Now, I know some of you may have had a boyfriend or girlfriend at six, seven, eight, nine, but I'm not sure if it was really a romantic relationship or if you were just sort of uh, practicing a rule, kind of like you would practice uh, being doctor or mommy or anything else, right? Um, I remember when I was in, when I was six years old, I had a girlfriend. Her name was Terry. She lived next door and she was five years old. And that was my first girlfriend, whatever it was. Uh, but we just played trucks in the driveway together and I thought she was kind of cute. But that was my first uh, my first thing. But really, uh, uh, romantic relationships are going to begin to blossom uh, uh, in mature form in early adolescence. And you're going to kind of notice this sort of pattern with romantic relationships. In middle school, sixth and seventh grade, we're all going to have romantic attractions and we're going to uh, like this boy or that girl. But you know what? We may not even talk to this boy or that girl. We may instead just have a crush on them. So the kind of the weird thing is when you're first in middle school, you may develop your romantic feelings, but a lot of times you don't even have the courage to act on them. And so that's sort of the first sort of relationship pattern we get into. But then uh, in eighth, ninth, and 10th grade, you might actually get a boyfriend or girlfriend, somebody you call on the phone after school or send text messages to or WhatsApp or Instagram, right? And so these are sort of going to be the romantic, your first romantic relationships. They're probably not going to last that long. 
They, and they definitely won't be that deep emotionally. Um, I don't know. Uh, I actually, I remember uh, my first uh, relationship in seventh grade, sixth grade uh, was with this girl, Robin. Uh, she was my girlfriend for two weeks and I never even spoke to her because I was too shy. But we were boyfriend and girlfriend. We were going together for two weeks. And I remember uh, she broke up with me through her friend, Tina, uh, because I wouldn't talk to her. I was too shy. Now, Facebook, Tina grew up and in retrospect, I should have been chasing Tina and not Robin, but hey, that's middle school for you. Um, but so are sort of your early romantic relationships, you might talk on the phone, but they won't be deep and emotional. And then most of us, when we're getting into our junior and senior year of high school, we're going to have our first true love, if you will. And this is sort of that real uh, uh, shared uh, relationship where maybe you date them for months or maybe even a year or two and you fall into deep love. Um, so how many of you... Uh, how many of you followed this pattern? Now, I'll bet some of you out there were probably early bloomers and had a real honest-to-goodness boyfriend or girlfriend in sixth grade that you talked to for days or weeks or months. Were any of you what we would call early bloomers uh, in terms of the relationship uh, uh, progression? Like I said, in sixth grade, I had a girlfriend for two weeks, but I never really talked to her. Uh, so I don't know if I'm really an early bloomer or not. Or paged you. Oh, my God. Mel G, are you talking about adolescent uh, romance relationships? Paging. That's so 1990s. How freaking hilarious is that? I'm sorry I didn't see the comment before then or I would have died laughing. Lorena was a player. I'll bet you were. Uh, sort of the uh, private school girl there, living it up with the guys, the jet set lifestyle down in Venezuela, huh, Lorena? Funny, very good. Okay, now, uh, just like friends, dating is a good thing if you have uh, the right kind of partner, right? So uh, dating is linked with positive development and it's a measure of well of being well adjusted. Um, if you've got good emotional control, good impulse control, um, uh, good social skills, then uh, it's easier to find yourself a romantic partner. So having a romantic partner is kind of a sign of being well adjusted. So it's not a bad thing when your boyfriend, when your uh, son or daughter gets themselves a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Not a bad thing at all. And you know what? It's good to practice these sort of relationship activities that we're going to have to engage in later in life. Uh, learning how to communicate, learning how to have disagreements, uh, learning how to work past disagreements. These are all good things uh, that will help children develop social and romantic competence, right? So you're sort of practicing the dry run for the heavy duty relationships that you're gonna have later on. But you know what? Um, sometimes if you date too early, Lorena, like you said, you were a player, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, but dating too early can be associated with ne negative outcomes like substance abuse, delinquency, and early sexual behaviors. So if you get in the game a little too early, sometimes you start playing big, big kid games uh, before you should have to play big kid games. And you know, uh, your research suggests that Females who date older boys uh, at first uh, have a little higher self-esteem, but they uh, they develop they're more likely to develop uh, depression as they move through adolescence. So females dating older boys are more likely to experience depression. And I wonder if that has something to do with sexual behavior being pressed upon them uh, when they're too early. Okay. Uh, Adolescents and their media, right? Uh, so 
Uh, <laughs> Mel G mentions a pager. I don't know if any of you even remember what a pager is. Some of you probably are too young to even know what a pager is. But there's all kinds of types of media out there. Emails, instant messaging, social networking sites, chat rooms, video sharing, photo sharing, multiplayer, online computer games, and virtual worlds. There is little, literally an entire virtual universe that your children can get engaged with. And you know, uh, it's a good way to meet friends and expand your social horizons, but sometimes you can fall too deep in the virtual world and uh, lose touch with the real world here. And what your book talks about is the growing dependence and interest that kids have in social media. I have a graph over here, if you see, all the way down to the side. This shows you sort of the pattern of adolescent media usage that we see. And what you're going to notice, if you look down at the bottom two graphs, you'll notice that kids... Uh, their media usage spikes after about 10 years of age heading into early adolescence. So uh, you'll notice that eight to 10 year olds spend about eight hours a day on social media, which is a ton of time anyhow. Um, but as soon as they move to 11 to 14 year old period, they uh, almost, let's see, eight, it's a 50% increase in the amount of time they spend on social media. Almost 12 hours a day using media of some sort. This is kind of laughable to me uh, because when I was growing up as a kid uh, in, in uh, the 1970s, they used to talk about how if you spent more than half an hour a day on television, which was our only form of media in the 70s, it was considered bad. And they were like, don't let your kids spend more than half an hour a day watching TV. And now the typical eight-year-old spends three and a half hours watching TV uh, and uh, uh, almost an hour on computers uh, and another hour on video games. So your average eight to 10 year old is using seven and almost eight hours of media every day. Um, that's got to have an effect. Depression, okay, good enough. So Lorena's uh, responding back to the question I talked about early onset of dating and romantic dating. And you said that definitely there might've been some uh, 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 early sexual behavior and depression. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, dial up. <laughs> Melanie from the 1990s. Oh my goodness, you might as well be talking about a phonograph, uh, Mel G, dial up connections. Yes, we are definitely in a post dial up world. So what I want you to notice, what I want you to abstract from this graph that I have here is that eight to 10 year olds spend a ton of time on social, on media, but that absolutely explodes in the, uh, in the middle school years. 92% of kids are using a uh, text message. 75% of kids are on a social media site. Um, in 2004, 39% of adolescents had cell phones, but now 93% have cell phones. That's in 2019. It may even be higher now. Who knows? And uh, 24 percent of us, one in four kids, are constantly online on smartphones and mobile devices. And again, I will refer you to Jen Twenge's uh, iGen uh, book on iGen and the effects that she thinks have, uh, she thinks that spending all of your time on a mobile phone has on kids levels of activity and their uh, levels of depression and anxiety. Um, and I'm just going to give you the bottom line sort of statement here. Higher level of social media usage is linked to poor self body image, more depression and anxiety, uh, more uh, eating disorders, a uh, greater sense of narcissism, less sleep, and a higher level of drinking. There are really a ton of negative effects associated uh, from being on social media too much. Now, can you keep your 13-year-old completely off social media? No, you will make them an outcast in their world if you don't. But you, as a parent, have to find a way to monitor and limit that social media usage as much as you possibly can. Your kid's developing ideas about who they are, and there's a lot of cyberbullying that goes on, and uh, kids can get picked on a lot easier these days than they could back in the 1970s when you had to pick on kids in the hallway at school. Now, the less time you keep 
the less time you, your kid spends on the uh, screen, uh, the better their quality of life is going to be. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about adolescent problems, juvenile delinquency. Uh, juvenile delinquent is any kid that breaks the law or engages in behavior that is considered illegal. Uh, stealing, shoplifting, uh, smoking uh, marijuana, drinking alcohol, destroying things, vandalizing property. These are all forms of juvenile delinquency. And I'll bet some or maybe all of you people have probably engaged in one of these delinquent behaviors in your life. Somebody may have taken a pack of gum. Somebody may have had a sip of alcohol. One of you may have thrown an egg or broken a window. Um, but juvenile delinquency is typically a pattern of this kind of behavior that we'll see. And I'm sure all of you have a friend or two or knew somebody from school who engaged in juvenile delinquent uh, behavior. So some fast facts on juvenile delinquency. Uh, delinquency rates greatly increased from 1990 to 1996, although they flattened off a little bit, just like crime spiked uh, from 1960 to 1996. Uh, delinquency rates uh, spiked as well. Uh, you probably guessed uh, males uh, are more likely to engage in delinquency than females. Basically, uh, males are more likely to demonstrate any kind of externalizing probably problem, and females are more likely to demonstrate internalizing problems. So your boys are more likely to be delinquents, but your females are more likely to have depression or anxiety. And uh, you'll notice these kinds of patterns between externalizing and internalizing uh, disorders uh, in males and females. Um, <coughs> rates of delinquency are extremely high among minority groups and lower socio in youth from lower socioeconomic statuses. Uh, the culture and the situation that you find yourself in and the societal pressures that you find yourself in uh, often contribute to the performance of these uh, delinquents' behaviors. Oh my God, M my space. Holy cow, Mel G, why don't you just go ahead and start talking about Ataris and ColecoVision? <coughs> <coughs> Do you know what an Atari is, Mel? Uh, I bet none of you know what Atari is. Um, now, uh, we typically differentiate between early onset juvenile delinquency and non-early onset juvenile delinquency. Those kids who get engaged in those delinquent behaviors before the age of 11 are more likely to turn out worse uh, than the kids who do that in middle and junior high school less likely to finish school, more likely to have emotional problems, more likely to get involved with the, uh, with the, uh, j with the uh, court system. Um, so early onset delinquency is especially uh, problematic. Okay, so Mal G does remember the Atari. It was the first video game ever created and boy, it stunk. Right. All right. So what are some of the causes of delinquency? You know, you can sort of your book talks about the causes. And in my mind, you can group them into three broad categories, your environmental factors, your cognitive factors and your parental factors. So um, as with most most problems, societal problems that you're going to see, they are associated with lower SES. So uh, poor kids are going to be more likely to engage in all kinds of problematic bad behaviors. And you know what, this is because of their cultural environment that they find themselves in. You know, uh, one of the reasons that they're maybe in a low SCS uh, area is because their parents have a drug problem. Uh, they're more likely to be maltreated. Their parents may be in jail. So there are any kinds of sort of situational factors that may cause them to engage in the delinquent behavior. Now, Lorena, you talked about uh, your experience. Now, Actually, no, I'll, I'll save that. I'll save that for parental monitoring. We'll go back. That's a different point to make. Um, but you know what? Research has found is if your older brother or sister or your friends are engaging in, this kinds, in these kinds of delinquent activities, you're more likely to engage in these delinquent activities. So what's going to determine whether or not your kid gets engaged in this stuff? If they're in a situation where they're being abused or they're seeing poor role models in their parents or their friends 
or siblings are getting engaged in uh, engaging in these delinquent behaviors, they're more likely to engage in that delinquent behavior. If you remember uh, the video we watched about the guy who joined MS-13, he said that his older brother and his family members were in uh, the gang, so it just made sense to him to join the gang as well. Exactly, that happens a lot more often than you would think. Now, there are also cognitive factors. Kids who aren't doing well in school and are having trouble meeting the challenges that they're supposed to meet in their normal environment are going to be more likely to act out. So if your kid's not doing well in school, that's a risk factor for acting out. If you remember, we talked about developing self-control and sustained attention as important information processing factors the qualities that you need to work on with your three and four and five year old. Uh, you know, we talked about sort of nurturing those cognitive skills in your children. Having poor self-control or having difficulty paying attention is going to feed into your child not doing well in school, which is going to make them more likely to act out. Okay? Oh, wow, Lorena knows Atari too. Hmm. Y'all must have went to a museum to see Atari. Okay, and then parental factors. Lorena, you mentioned that you grew up in a pretty well-off family, but that your mom and dad maybe didn't pay as much attention to what you were doing and let you get away with more things uh, than you should have. They, they weren't monitoring you as well. Uh, you know what? Uh, m monitoring is definitely an important factor in determining whether or not your kid's getting into involved in delinquent behavior. Monitoring the friends they hang out with, monitoring their grades, monitoring aspects of their life as indicators that things are going right or wrong. What you're looking for in a parent as a change in your kid's behavior. If you're not paying attention to school, how can you see a drop in their school performance? If you're not paying attention to their friends, how can you tell when they're bringing the wrong friends home? So it's all about monitoring. And then your book suggests that being the kind of parent that has limits, but also talks to your kid, being an authoritative parent is associated with especially low levels of delinquent behavior. So if your mom and dad have rules, but still talk to you um, and let you uh, 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 participate in the decision-making process, uh, your likelihood of getting in involved in delinquent behavior is extremely, extremely low. Mel G's gotta go back to work. Thanks for dropping in, Mel G. Uh, she dropped some 80s and 90s uh, uh, iconic uh, things on us and then took off. So thank you for bringing in pagers and dial-up connection and all that stuff, Mel G. Now, uh, adolescent problem. Another problem uh, is depression and suicide. Remember, suicide is the third leading cause of death in 10 to 19 year olds. Now, while suicide rates are still low compared to other parts, other age groups, um, still this is the third leading cause of death for kids this age. So it's important that we focus on the issues that lead kids to depression and subsequent suicides. Now, adolescents contemplate or attempt it unsuccessfully more often than they commit it but they do think about it. And females are more likely to actually attempt suicide, but males are more likely to succeed. And I think a lot of the time they use firearms, uh, which tends to uh, result in a more successful outcome for the would-be uh, 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 would uh, victim. Um, now, what factors contribute uh, to depression? Your book's gonna talk about uh, your book's going to talk about having uh, 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 certain factors that are more likely to uh, contribute to you uh, engaging in suicide. Uh, and let me, actually, I'm going to read these off because I'm not as uh, uh, good with these. But your book suggests uh, that there are dopamine-related genes uh, that you will see in adolescence and that there may be a dopamine uh, related gene that predicts level of depression. Uh, dopamine makes you feel good and low levels of dopamine uh, can be associated with depression. So there is a, a, a potentially a genetic link uh, between uh, genes and depression. 
And then you also uh, talk, uh, talks about certain family factors. Uh, positive parenting characteristics such as emotional and educational support are, are, are related with lower uh, levels of depression. Um, Mother-daughter uh, uh, co-rumination, so spending a lot of time actually talking with your mom uh, uh, about problems as a daughter actually is associated with an increased likelihood of depression uh, syndromes. Uh, if your parents depressed, if your parents emotionally unable, if your parents are having marital problems, these are all family factors that are associated with higher levels of depression. And you know what? Uh, poor peer relationships are also associated uh, with depression. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. If you, uh, let's see, doo -doo -doo. problems in romantic relationships are associated with adolescent depressions and uh, adolescents with depressed friends were more likely to be depressed. And having Friends that weren't available emotionally for you is also associated with depression. So there are sort of these three causes. Is it genes? Maybe. Is it your family? Maybe. Is it uh, the social support provided by friends? Maybe. All of these factors feed into levels of depression. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> now, uh, in, in fact, so we have risk factors for suicide. Uh, uh, one of the hallmarks of depression is suicidal ideation and sometimes acting out on those ideations. So uh, one of the things that really worries uh, uh, people is when adolescents develop these depressive syndromes because they are at a higher risk for attempting suicide. And in fact, if you look at the chart below me, um, it's going to show you the suicide attempts by U.S. adolescents from different uh, ethnicities. And these are the number of suicide attempts per 100,000. So uh, what I want you to notice is that there are risk factors. So having an unstable and unhappy family where the parents have drug problems or are arguing um, uh, <clears throat> is going to uh, inc increase your risk for suicide. Lack of supportive relationships. Being alone, having nobody to socially support you, being isolated from your friends associated uh, with an uh, increase in suicidal uh, ideation. And if you look at this graph right here, you'll notice that there are definitely different cultural differences in uh, suicide attempts. <clears throat> with American Indians having a much greater risk of suicide attempts than other ethnic groups here in the United States. Uh, again, genetic factors and being depressed are also indicators of likely suicidal ideation and potential attempts. So as we develop this sense of identity and we start developing romantic relationships, as we get involved in cliques and groups, um, all of this social comparison for the first time in this uh, need to integrate socially with other people creates a lot of pressure that for the first time brings these feelings of depression and suicidal thoughts to the forefront. Now, it's never going to get better, um, but you're probably going to be better at, at, uh, at dealing with it as you get older. But the adolescence period is a really difficult time because this is the first time that children are starting to face these social pressures. Well, so that's all I wanted to talk about this week, sort of the group context uh, that, that, that uh, characterizes the adolescent period. Next week, we're going to move to the sixth period of life. We're going to be talking about early adulthood, the 20s and 30, 30s. And we're going to be talking about sexual and cohabitation patterns. We're going to be talking about work identities. And we're going to be talking about health behaviors that you can engage in in your 20s and 30s that have long-range impl implications for your health and well-being in later stages of life. Does anybody have any questions for me? It doesn't look like it. I'm going to go ahead and shut off the broadcast now. If anybody has any questions, you can type them in the chat bar and I'll stay on chat for a few minutes answering them. 
or if you have a question, you can text it to me using the Remind texting tool, and I'll be happy to talk with you. Don't forget to do your uh, discussion board that's due tonight so you can get collaboration credit or extra credit. And if you have any questions with your homework, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, uh, that's all I have to say, so I'm going to say take care, and I will see you again next week.